Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Ajit Varki. Uh, Ajit has training in many fields and many disciplines, physiology, medicine, biology, biochemistry, uh, from Christian Medical College, University of Nebraska, and Washington University, St. Louis. He's uh, trained and board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and oncology and has been part of the faculty of the University of California, San Diego since 1982. He's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, American Society for Clinical Investigation, Association of American Physicians. Uh, He's also the recipient of a Merit Award for the NIH, uh, the American Cancer Society Faculty Research Award, and uh, three uh, highest honors in the field, Carl Meyer Award International Organizational Award, Rosa Lind Kornfeld Award for Lifetime Achievement in Glycobiology, and the ASBMB Herbert Taber Research Award. He was president of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. He was president of the Society for Glycobiology and was editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Um, He has done so many wonderful things within his uh, fields of study, and he has also written a fascinating book with the late Danny Brower. That book is called Denial, Self-Deception, False Beliefs, and the Origins of the Human Mind, uh, which is what we talk about in this conversation. Now, I think I mentioned it in the conversation, but I read this book um, probably 10 years ago. It's been out for about 15, I believe. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, Why, how did we evolve to deceive ourselves, deception, lying, false beliefs? I I found that very, very interesting. And the, you know, Ajit and uh, Danny, they they, uh, met once, I think in person for an hour and a half, two hours. And then Danny tragically, you know, died quite suddenly at a pretty young age. And he kind of takes over his idea and his theory and and made it into a book and expanded on it. And that's what the book denial is is about covers the theory. So we talk all about it. Uh, We talk about the evolutionary perspective of human origins, uh, self-awareness in humans, theory of mind, uh, false beliefs in denial and how they evolved. Uh, We discuss lying, self-deception, religion, positive uses of deception, climate change, Um, the future of the mind over reality theory, which is presented in the book and many other topics. I have been wanting to talk to him for a while and, uh, it was, it was wonderful rereading the book and, uh, it was wonderful to, uh, to, to talk with him as is mentioned, um, in the beginning of, of the conversation. Unfortunately, Ajit has, um, developed Parkinson's, uh, disease, which he was, um, you know, kind enough to give his time and his energy. Um, and, uh, even though his body is, is struggling in some ways, uh, his mind is very sharp. He still has so much to offer and contribute all from what he already has in his career. And I, I really, um, took it very well that he gave me his time, um, despite all the challenges that he's facing to, to talk about his work. So it's, uh, it was, a, it was really a big, big honor to, to have him come on and, and discuss it. As always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. Get over there, follow, like, subscribe, uh, share widely with your friends. If you like this conversation, uh, take a look around at all the other ones. There's bound to be other uh, conversations I've had with other people that are are, are similar or similar topics. Definitely have talked about evolution a a ton on the podcast, so uh, give those a listen as well and uh, support Ajit's work. And um, now I bring him, Ajit Varki. I am here with Ajit Varki. Uh, Ajit, thank you so much for coming on the, the podcast. I'm, I'm greatly honored to, to have you on here. My pleasure. So uh, we're going to talk all about um, uh, a book that you wrote and you had a, a co-author, uh, I guess a Posthumously, he's 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 uh, been deceased for many years. Um, but uh, the book is called "Denial, Self Deception, False Beliefs, and the Origins of the Human Mind." And you go through much territory in the book. It's uh, it's been out for a couple of years, uh, but you've yeah, continued on on with this, and it's a uh, very very fascinating. So I really want to get into it. Uh, I should say at the outset for listeners, 
that uh, uh, Ajit has been uh, uh, so so kind enough to give us time and energy. He has uh, been dealing with early onset uh, Parkinson's, so you may hear some of the difference in um, you know uh, vocal intonations and kind of you know, prosody of speech and things like that. So he's he's allowed me to let listeners know that at the top. And uh, even even bigger thanks for for being able to to do the conversation and uh, uh, no amidst all of those challenges. So I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, okay, so it's, before it's we get ironic to, that that we're talk, going to talk about humans and <laughs> Parkinson's disease, maybe a human human specific disease. So it's poetic <laughs> justice. <laughs> so yeah, there it is. Right, it's, it's very ironic. <laughs> um, so just really quick before we get into the book, uh, just tell listeners a brief snapshot of who you are professionally and academically and what you currently still still do yeah i'm, I'm currently a distinguished professor of medicine and cell and molecular medicine at the university of california san diego i was born in india and had my early early training in india I went to christian medical college Bellor, which is one of the prominent medical schools in india mm. came to the u.s uh, in 1975 and stayed on eventually to become a physician scientist and worked in hematology and oncology mostly. But then, but then I ran into some interesting things that directed me towards human evolution. I ended up writing this book, which I didn't intend to write originally. So, mm. Mm. so. and uh, you you continue to to still uh, teach and and do research uh, at, uh, the, uh, the, at the university. Going back on my research for these mm-hmm. health problems and also I can do, do a little bit of research and do some some teaching, but not as much anymore. Mm, mm. Very I'm nice. still keeping in touch. I started an organization called CARTA, which is about the origin of human origins, mm. origin of humans, and that's not been taken over by others. If mm. you look that up, anybody can look it up, C-A-R-T-A, and you'll find about 500 talks about uh, human origins of different different angles. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, well, it's, it's your your contributions are, are, are fantastic. So maybe you just tell us how the book came about. You, you talk about it in the introduction of the book. Uh, but just give me the brief, you know, overview story yeah. of, of how this book came about, how you met Danny, how you continued on with the book. Just give us that brief story there. So as I mentioned, as hematologists, oncologists, I treat patients with cancer. And I noticed that people with cancer and, and the doctors are very optimistic about what might happen, even though things weren't that optimistic. And then I had, my daughter was born and I wondered how this helpless baby became a human being uh, over time. And I also happened to find the first genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees. Came from an observation in hematology, actually. So back in the, in the, in the 80s, it was thought that there was, there was only uh, humans and chimps had identical genes and they expressed different. Now we know it's very different. But at that time, there was none known. And I found the first known genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees. So uh, occasionally I give a talk about this, and occasionally I talk about what makes us human, you know, a little bit outside my field at that time, especially. Sat down for lunch at the University of Arizona, gave a lecture, sat down for lunch, and this fellow sat next to me and said, you're all asking the wrong question. <laughs> so I thought he's some kind of kook, and I listened to him further, realized he had a really interesting idea I'd never thought about it before. So I said, his name was Danny Brower. I said, Danny, you should, we, should, we should talk. And we sat there for an hour and a half after everybody had left lunch. I came back, couldn't get, get his idea out of my mind. So I finally tried to find him, and a year later, I looked up and I found his obituary. He had dropped dead very suddenly. Mm. So I contacted his friends, and some, some people said, yeah, he was writing a book. I didn't know what happened exactly, but he never published anything about his idea. So I wrote a letter to Nature describing Danny's idea and my embellishments of it, mm. and I thought that was the end of it. Then his widow contacted me and said, can you please finish Danny's book? Mm. So I ended up writing a book with a dead man who I met for an hour and a half. It became a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> and so he's a cause, of course, but of course it's developed a lot beyond what he originally thought, but the original idea came from him. Mm. And so mm. now that's that's what I'm, I'm going to be talking about today. And the book came out after that uh, based on the discussion and my subsequent investigations. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's such a, it's so interesting how these things can happen sometimes where you have right. a chance meeting with somebody, they tell you a cool idea. Uh, and then, you know, you can kind of get with it. And then sometimes life is, is, is wild and how it will take people from us. And right. we're left with these, these ideas and you know, what do we do with it? So I think it's great that a, that you continued with it and B that you, uh, you know, made, gave him the, the co-authorship as well. Not just like, a right. you know, an, uh, an acknowledgement um, or something. 
And Zbiro, and Zbiro got 30%, no, 50% of the proceeds. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Huge. Yeah. So you, you, you cover a lot of ground in the book. The main thing I want to talk about, and we'll get into this, is uh, theory of mind, self-awareness, um, mind over reality, all that stuff. But I, I want to ask just generally, if you set it up for us, obviously, you know, there's, there's a whole thing of this that you can go into. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess just kind of sort of for, for the purposes of what you're trying to explain in the book and what mm -hmm. you've gone on to explain after, this idea of understanding us as humans and how we are from an evolutionary perspective. Because what you talk about early in the book is mm -hmm. not how did we evolve the way that we did, but why other animals didn't evolve the way that we exactly. did or other things. And so, so maybe just tell us that there's this like 5 million year history of the, the, of the apes, which have, you know, all the, the progenitors for, you know, you have Australopithecus and Homo erectus and you get the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So this is big, big, big history. Why is it important contextually to understand this evolutionary lineage and this framework for some of the ideas about self-awareness and personhood? Yeah, so many people have worked on the origin of humans, and the general idea has always been that somehow a particular group of apes evolved into a lineage which has then evolved all these new cognitive mechanisms and became us. And Danny Brown said you should be asking the, wrong, you're asking the wrong question because if you look through nature, you find crows, chimpanzees, dolphins, whales, many, many smart creatures all over the world. They've been, they've been around for 500 million years. Mm -hmm. Very smart, very social, very warm-blooded, very capable capable of doing all kinds of interesting things that we thought they couldn't do. But there's only one human. Mm -hmm. So you should be asking, she said, so you shouldn't be asking what made us human. She asked what stopped everybody else. So he called it the wall. And I, mm -hmm. I then I expanded to call it the evolutionary psychological barrier. In other words, there were many species around Neanderthals, Denisovs, many other species closely related to us. Yet there's only one of us left standing. And we've taken over the world, basically, and just destroying it now. Mm. And uh, the question is, why is there only one of us? Mm. That's the question. So you look at the five, last 500 million years, and there were many lineages, actually, especially in the last few hundred thousand years across, across the old world. Mm -hmm. But there's only one of us left. And yeah. I've, I've come, well, since, since I did the book, I've come to the conclusion that maybe the thing I'm talking about is the barrier, the ba barrier that, that resulted in only one species being present with these abilities. Mm. Mm. One of the things that makes humans or the things that make us somewhat unique of sorts or different, if you will, and many people have written about this, is we have bigger brains that show increased intelligence, cognition, abstraction, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, we can make tools. We can problem solve. We're bipedal. We have niche selection. All of these things are relevant to humans, and it's not that other animals don't have them. I mean, there's a certain type of intelligence for you know crows and other animals. But all of these things... Um, we also have this ability for language and high abstraction and, and all of these elements that we understand through genetics and social environmental changes. <clears throat> How are all of these things putting us on the road for uh, self-awareness, theory of mind, which we'll come to in a minute, but how do these things are basically the building blocks or the parts needed right. to have those things and why other animals maybe don't? Mm -hmm. Just a quick uh, uh, statement Bigger, big brains are overrated. <laughs> and those big brains are important for humans in our evolution. There's plenty of evidence we'll talk about another time, but big brains are not, not required at, at the mm. present time. Mm. So you, you talk about bird brains, right? I just told you crows and dolphins. I think you had Nicola Caton on, on your I did, program yes. She was lovely. Heard about she was the lovely. That birds can do, right? Yeah, that's so, great research. So that's uh, the big brain in humans is an interesting problem which we don't understand, it needs to be studied later, but it's not, it's not necessary, it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Mm. So, okay, so then, and going back to these things, yeah, something happened that allowed us to break through into these additional features that mostly social mammals and birds don't have. Mm. And you should talk about language, high abstraction, all these things. You can make a long list of things that, that are uniquely human, mm -hmm. or unusually human. Actually, the word uniquely is dangerous to give in any sure, sure. such context. You say, mm -hmm. I tend to call it, my friend Pascal Gagnon and I tend to call it distinctly human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that are not found in close relatives. You might find some other lineage somewhere else. But So we have these very, very, very unusual abilities. And uh, well, language, as you said, is very important. Our social, environmental interactions, high abstraction, ability to think of the future and the past, and so on. 
And as you're going to talk about thinking of minds of others. Mm. So really coming back to Danny's question, says, how come only we did it? So that's the question. Mm. And and so what what do you, what do you think? I guess you know after writing the book and all these things, what do you feel is the answer for that of why we can do it and other animals cannot? So I think the reason is I think that this what Danny called the wall originally, mm-hmm. which I call now the psychological evolutionary barrier, is what we, we, we got across and everybody has got stuck at. So think of the think of physiological evolutionary barrier. If you if you if you got uh, if you try and go from water to land, that took about millions of years for that to be achieved because going from water to land is not easy, right? You don't just cross over and just start walking on the land. Mm-hmm. Many, many, many trials had to occur and it was evolutionary selection. Eventually, a few species managed to make it onto land. Right. So that's the psycholo- physiological evolutionary barrier. So I'm talking about a psychological evolutionary barrier, something that stops all the other animals in their tracks, basically they can't, do, can't evolve any further along this lineage. And we kind of broke through a wormhole, I think, and came out with this, this ability, basically. That's the idea. Mm, mm. And so connected with this is we have self-awareness. Now, we're not the only ones that have self-awareness. Right. Maybe tell me about, uh, you talk about in the book, obviously there's been papers about it. Obviously people for a long time really emphasized, okay, to know yourself or to see or recognize yourself is... Um, you know, there's an element of abstraction, right? To, to know that it's mm-hmm. not something else or whatever. And, and many animals cannot do this. But we've, we have this measure, this, this mirror self-recognition task, right? That, you know, can an animal look mm-hmm. at themselves in the mirror and they recognize it's them, it's not someone else, or they just see nothing. And so we know a few animals that have done this. But then afterwards, people got really excited about this. But then people started saying, well... That's not really saying anything, though. It's not really well, it's saying, saying what we body, want yeah. it to say. Yeah, yeah. It's not telling what we want it to really say, what we're trying to, this idea of knowing yourself or knowing your personhood. So maybe just tell us about generally self-awareness and how much you do or don't like the mirror self-recognition task. Yeah, now. I think, I think uh, to be very clear, I'm not an expert. Most of these topics are sort of self-start expert, but mm-hmm. there's certainly problems with, this, with the with the mirror self-recognition test where you put a spot on a, on a sleeping animal's head and then they get used to a mirror and then the the dog or the or the monkey will just look at it for a while and then think it's another animal and leave. The chimpanzee mm. will go look behind the mirror to see who's in who's there. Mm. And come back and look at it look at himself or herself and say, Oh that's me. Start mm. examining herself. So what you just have to say is it was also notable is the absence of self recognition in so many creatures. That's what I think is significant. Mm. And so happens that the creatures that have self recognition are exactly the same ones I talked about. Dolphins Elephants, mm. chimpanzees, mm. crows, all these species recognize mm. the mirror. So mm. there's something going on there, which is equivalent to saying, you know, if that's me, mm. I'm actually a person, you know, and I can recognize myself. Mm. Mm. It's hard to prove conclusively, and I'm sure every uh, every species has some level of recognition of the environment and themselves, but these particular species, again, my coincidence, happen to the same one of self-awareness. Mm. Mm. So do we do we think that... You know, again, I mean, you know, is this is this a thing that we should continue to use to to make sense of this, or or maybe the mirror self recognition isn't as important as we we think it is? I think it's, I think it's no longer that important because it's a step along the way to where we are now. Mm. Mm. So we are not only self aware; we are aware of the self awareness of others. I'm aware of your self awareness. That's why we're able to have this conversation, right? Mm. Mm. I realize that others have minds like mine. Mm. So, mm. so the awareness of self-awareness mm. of the other self-awareness of others. Mm. That's so be the next step. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the book, you talk about theory of mind, which many people have have you know uh, talked about this and, and and written about this, and uh, we don't have to get into it here. But you know, many folks within um, that that research and do um, a lot of study on autism <laughs> spectrum disorders talk a lot about theory of mind, um, etc. So maybe just tell us, you give these four stages, which were really, really interesting. I liked how you, you organized it, this self-awareness, right. the rudimentary theory of mind, full theory of mind, and extended theory of mind. So maybe just, yeah, right. tell us what it is and, and how you break it down in these four categories. So basically, the theory of mind is many terms, intentionality, attribution of mental states, intersubjectivity, mind reading, perspective taking, other regarding impulses, many terms. Basically, it's the recognition that somebody else 
has a mind like yours or is different from yours, and you can recognize that person as another individual with mind. Mm-hmm. And so the, the term I chose to use is theory of mind. It's not the only one. But I found that it's hard to define it exactly because it goes to different levels. I came arbitrarily, you know, some of the experts may not like it, I came up with four stages. Early self-awareness, like you have a new, in, in, in a you know, two-year-old child who can recognize yourself in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Rudimentary theory of mind, like a four or five-year-old that can re- recognize the minds of parents and but by the age of six or so, they start telling lies and they get really good at it. And by the time, time they're 15, they can, they can talk to people all across the internet and recognize <laughs> the minds of everybody across the planet. And that's extended to you. So it's not a continuum, it's just, it's just a continuum, not, not ex- steps actually. I just use it as a practical way of approaching it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think everybody else stops, all the other species I mentioned stop at the level of blended theory of mind mm-hmm. and yeah. full theory of mind, but they don't have the extended theory of mind, I think. Mm-hmm. So the, the things about the extended theory of mind is some of the things that make us, uh, what did you say, distinct, right, as, as humans? Um, distinct, yeah. And, and I'm going to go with that a little bit, another step further. When we think mm-hmm. of theory of mind, for example, the, I, the briefly when I talked about this, there's usually this example of like, I can read um, a novel, let's say, let's mm-hmm. say uh, Sherlock Holmes. Right. Exactly. And, and I can read uh, the story and, and I'm reading the story and in the story, the character, uh, let's say Sherlock Holmes is thinking about what Watson is thinking about and what he dreamed about and all these things. There's a certain layers of abstraction there because my mind is reading a book that was written by someone long ago and this came from their mind of a created character's mind thinking about right. another created character's mind. There's just exactly. a full yeah. level of exactly. abstraction here that, as far as yeah. we know, other animals probably can't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because obviously language helps there, but sure. being able to, yeah, I, I often use the, the Sherlock Holmes example just to say that if I say Mahatma Gandhi, you know who I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. If I talk about Sherlock Holmes, who never even existed, you still know what I'm talking about. If right. you've read or read about him, or right. seen a movie or something like that. So, right, 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 right. So that's, that's the ability humans have of imagining the minds of others and imagining the minds of others that don't even exist. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. Really which powerful, is... right? I mean, it should be a really powerful thing in evolution to get this. Right. So you, you've talked about the wall already. So I guess the, the, the big middle part, the real central thing of the book is this idea that we've evolved false beliefs about a situation, namely that we are, we can deny reality of something uh, right. and that we do this and maybe other animals do not or who, who's to say, but how, how, talk about this. How do we develop these false beliefs where we can deny the reality of something? Uh, we don't so usually think, think of about, it that way. Right. If you think about reality and maybe humans are quite well, at least one species capable of really understanding reality, we can think... You can imagine the Big Bang even and atoms and things like that. Mm-hmm. You understand reality. Yet we can routinely deny reality as you can see all around us all the time, right? even right now. In every situation, you see humans do that. That's actually a very bad thing, right? If you start out uh, uh, as, a, as an animal that has you know, a, little bit, a little bit of uh, ability to be a little brave would be useful, but at some point you're going to get in trouble. If you're a wild beast who wants to go and check out the lions, you're not going to last very long, right? Mm-hmm. So, so any species that uh, uh, that achieves the ability to corrupt reality, alter reality, uh, or, or ignore reality, or modify it in any way they want, uh, shouldn't be around. Basically, so that's a, that's an evolutionary negative. Basically, mm. so that's the idea that the, this 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 was comes come from about it's not very useful. But there's one reality that's very scary, and that is death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So every animal, every animal has a unique built-in fight or flight response and a fear of death all the time. They don't know what it is, but they have an intrinsic fear. Mm. So how come I don't get up every morning and say, "Ooh, I might die today"? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even my patients with cancer would say, "Oh, I'm going to make it." You know, mm-hmm. where do we get that? Mm. And so that's 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 the unusual feature of I've coined the term reality denial. It's slightly different what's out there. You don't want to call it just denial. Mm-hmm. It's the ability to ignore or modify or or adjust or corrupt reality in different ways to the point where we eventually believe it completely ourselves. Look at some of the conspiracy theories out there these days. You know. How how 
I guess I think people, I mean, before I read the book, I never really thought about it. And uh, when I, I reread it before our conversation and it still hit me again of, I feel like a lot of the times we take this for granted, right? This ability, because exactly. you're, you're, you're right. I mean, if, if I'm walking or if I wake up every morning and I think, when am I going to die? Is it going to be the next mm -hmm. moment? Am I going to have this? Is this right. going to happen? Am I going to get hit by something? And we, we wouldn't be able to survive there. So I yeah. guess the question here is, is how essential is this component to sus suspend our belief in existence for a minute or to deny that we're going right. to die for a minute or, or keep it at bay? How important is that right. for us to survive now, but maybe in times past? How, what do you think about this? Yes, yeah, so I think that I mean, there's modern versions of this. Uh, there's the denial of death, Ernst Becker, a book, and then yeah, later yeah. came the ter terror management theory, where they talked about this. They point out that if you point if you point out humans that that the their danger of mortality, they do get concerned about it. They don't get very concerned about it. So the question is why. Mm. So we we should be scared to death about because the more we understand, the more dangerous things look like. So we're not. So how do we do this? And that's where this barrier comes in. So the idea is that the this this reality denial or corruption reality, whatever you want to call it, may be occurring in some animals occasionally, but then it's actually a bad thing. You're going to, you're going to be done in basic because you're not going to follow the, follow the reality. And if you have that situation, then that's not going to. That's a, that's a dead end. Mm. The idea here is that, as Danny started out with, and I expanded on, is that. The other other thing that's not positive is realizing you're going to die. Mm. And so, how do you realize you're going to die? You watch you watch somebody else die. So many animals, many sophisticated animals, see others die and they may react to it. But if you have full theory of mind, you understand the mind of the others mm. as a person. Then what does that translate into? I'm next. Mm -hmm. So, so imagine you imagine an elephant that. Guess the theory of mind. You're the first ones we've evolved in the last hundred thousand years. It's great, right? You can tell lies. You can. We just said it's very, very powerful. You can do many things with it. You can control everything. Mm. Then his friend dies in battle. Mm -hmm. Who he knew is another person. He says, "Oh, I'm next. Mm -hmm. What's he going to do? He's going to hide in the woods, right? Mm -hmm. He's not going to fight. He's not going to pass on his genes." Mm. Or a woman watches her sister die in childbirth and says, mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not right. going to do that. <laughs> right, At the end right. of reproduction. So mm -hmm. the idea here is that this I developed as the book came along and died more recently is that two evolution negatives, both of which are very bad initially mm -hmm. and occur very rarely, have to come together in the same brains at the same time. So two rare negatives come together and generate an unusual state like ours, and you slip through that wormhole, you get past that barrier or the wall, now you've got humans. Mm. But that can also help to explain why there's only one of us, basically. Mm. We came out of Africa, we were in Africa probably 200, 300,000 years ago, about 50, 100,000 years ago, we came out of Africa, spread across the world, and basically took over everything, and made it with all the other species that are very much like us. But I imagine that they hadn't Passed this barrier yet, and they couldn't pick up all the right genes from this new group, and so those who had it basically succeeded in the in the in the competition eventually. It's not like you know humans didn't arrive in in Europe and wipe out the Neanderthals all of a sudden. It took twenty thousand years, something like that. Mm -hmm. But over the long haul, all the other human human-like species failed basically, and they survived. And this the theory can I started saying this in the book, and I think think of it more. This might be true that. This what well, maybe maybe explain this this peculiarity of a single species that replaces everybody else. I, I'm think I'm listening to you talk about this, and it's it's very it's just, again it's just so interesting to think and sit with it. Is I, I I think about I'm sure you and and uh, listeners and myself included have been to a funeral, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> um, you know, there, it's a tough moment. No one likes funerals. Take a look I think people. Yeah. People, people don't like funerals because maybe it's sad because they lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. I always think about this because I've unfortunately mm -hmm. been to many funerals. Um, I always think about myself in the box, right? I think right. about what happens when I'm there. What happens when everybody's here for me? 
and I'm no longer mm-hmm. in existence. And like, it's just so, I don't want to think about it, right? It's just terrible. Right, it's, right. I don't want to think about it, but it will happen. And I think that's maybe sometimes why people don't like funerals, but I think it's also this, this idea of we, it's like, you're, it's like if we're spending a lot of time avoiding mm-hmm. the reality of death, right? As we, we probably mm-hmm. need to. The idea of the funeral well, it's is not, like, it's not built, not built, 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 built into us, basically. Right. To very extent. So you have people, although if able, can able to, anxious <laughs> person can't leave home in the morning, so you've got the full right. range. Yeah. yeah. I think the idea of funerals or, or death in that way is just kind of forcing us to like behold it. We have to, we have to see but on it. The, on the other hand, I uh, quote some old Hindu scriptures about vairagyams, different sort of resolutions. Mm. So you're in the funeral, say, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to improve myself. I'm going to be a good person. When I Fair. die, people will think greatly of me. Fair. Fair, yeah. Two yeah. hours later, you're saying, asking your wife, what's for dinner? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true. And if you want somebody very close, it's gone. The feeling is gone, right? So the TNT yeah, people yeah. often show that you expose people to death they, so a short time after they change their way they behave and their reactions so on. Mm. Eventually, it just fades out, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. it's, it's another example of the, yeah, mm. these abilities we have. In a way, it's suppressing that belief. Yeah, most certainly. You, you, there's one p- bit I picked up this time reading it, what, the book, when, when I didn't get it the first time, which was, there was something you said in there. I'm curious what you mean. You said that, Reality denial is in place before the emergence of full theory of mind. Why, why is that ordering of things important, you think? It's sort of a, maybe over it's sort of a chicken and egg problem. Mm. We just said that, that reality denial is bad news, right, by itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'd be arguing that extended theory of mind by itself would be bad news because you would have what's called, what I call now mortality salience, understanding of immortality, and the fear which any, any animal should have for that knowledge should shut you down, basically. Mm. So I don't think it's, I, more I thought about it, I think what happened is that we talk about briefly in the book that you had to evolve, co-evolve both things together. Mm. And that's the, the thing that made it very difficult. You have to have mm. the same individuals develop the same abilities at the same time. Mm. Mm. That's why it's very rare. Mm. That's very interesting. It's a, it, I can see the kind of chicken-egg problem here. Is, is, is mm-hmm. this like, you know, okay, what, which yeah, one is there? It's probably co-evolve, basically. It's both mm-hmm. cultural and genetic and... Mm-hmm. Yeah, to have the right condition. You know, Sarah Hurdy likes to point out that the newborn human baby would never survive with just a mom. Mm. It wasn't for all the other aunties and grandmothers around to help out. And they mm. all couldn't read each other's minds a little bit. It wouldn't work. Mm. You, can, you can certainly have other species that have, have cooperative breeding. Nowadays, mm-hmm. humans are unusual in that lineage, but we have the ability. So she suggests that's maybe the early stage of development theory of mind. Mm. So when we think about this, I, I want to I ask about um, one other concept you have here, which you talk about is this idea of lying. And that you mentioned mm-hmm. it earlier already, that full theory of mind, uh, even extended theory of mind, allows one to be more effective at lying about things, which you can, you can see is self-deception. Right. There's deception generally, mm-hmm. deception with other people. And maybe there's some advantage in selecting mates there, but... W- most people think of lying as a negative thing, which yeah, I don't necess- I think it can be a lot of the times, but maybe not always. But what do you think about this notion of self-deception and, and lying, whether to ourselves or to other people? Uh, is there any positive valence on that in terms of our evolution? Yeah, or, or just, how do you see just it? Just look, at, just look at the success of many politicians right now. <laughs> <laughs> just, right. And eventually right. you come to the point where if you, if you lie about something long enough, everybody believes it, basically. That's what yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did originally. Yeah. And so it's basically something that can help be both, both, both extreme positive and extreme negative. You can be like Mahatma Gandhi and take advantage of that knowledge. Or you can, be, you can just take over, take over others by, by lying and, and modifying and changing reality for others and for yourself. And like you said, there's also there's a lot of good books written about self-deceptions. Mm-hmm. We also corrupt our own reality, right? So as, as I think, for who put it, we are in denial of the denial of our own denial. <laughs> well, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, layers deep of abstraction, uh, even mm-hmm. on the deception point, right? Where is it, we're doing right. kind of all yes. these different things, which is, which is incredible how we're able to do that. Um, but I, I wonder... On this, on this bit of it, right? So we have these ideas, we have this way of trying to deny reality, we have these we have self-deception. 
And and we do this with with other people as well, obviously for nefarious purposes sometimes or many times. Mm-hmm. I want to ask about something I thought about from the book. First time I read it and the second time is this. Mm, you, you can you can get as spicy as you want here, but mm-hmm. do you think there's an evolutionary <clears throat> model for why religions came into existence as a way of deceiving mm-hmm. ourselves or as a way to right. give us a system to right. get the answer so we don't think about dying? We we know where we go mm-hmm. when we die, or we know which way we have to live right. while we're here. Do you is that is that too uh, is that too um, productionistic? I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, I was I was raised in Judeo Christian, I was Syrian, Syrian Christian from South India originally. So mm-hmm. I learned all about the Bible. I got stood surprised and whatnot. But I'm I'm, a, mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an agnostic right now. Well, but similar. I was religion, I was yeah, I was I very think, similar think, there. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I also was raised uh, fundamentalist the other Christian. Religion, religion, uh, the other religion taught me how to behave well and not lie and be good mm-hmm. to people and so on. Right, right. So we all live like Jesus. We're in much better condition. You know? mm-hmm, be like mm-hmm. Jesus. So, mm-hmm. but on the other hand, religion could have helped along the way here, denying reality, and could have helped us deny death at a mass scale. But then there, there are religions like Judaism, where I understand that there's not that much attention to afterlife, mm-hmm, right? And for to live at this time, so you don't necessarily need that. And atheists don't get up every morning and say, "Oh, I'm going to die today." You know, so mm-hmm. could have helped along the way. I think religions probably co-evolved along with this theory of mind. Here's the thing: if you take a list of a huge number of lists of things, language, religion, you know, uh, art, art, all kinds of things, put them all together, and take away denial, or take take away theory of mind, mm-hmm. you'd have an, maybe a child on art, autism spectrum, which they have lim- more limited theory of mind. It's one theory about that, and they can do ba- many things, but they're, they're somewhat more limited in some some aspects. Mm-hmm. Same thing would happen with anyone that's uh, you know, got, got any other problems with, with that. But religion is one way of dealing with these issues at a mass scale. And it certainly helped a lot of humans, some groups of humans survive and do well, but it's also given other humans a reason to be really dem- destructive. Mm. I think most of what we're talking about here is men, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. women. Mm-hmm. Is it is it incomplete or, you know, there's many people that have said things about religion as a kind of uh, cultural evolution, a kind of way mm-hmm. in which people have evolved this. You know, a lot of research shows that, you know, religion doesn't necessarily offer, I mean, it does, but it's not the morals that keep people together. It's more of uh-huh. the built sense of community building, right? That's a major right. variable there. Do you think that... Mm, People need to survive in groups or cohabitate together in ways where they don't kill each other, they don't harm each other. Yeah. That religion is a kind of adhesive that keeps people together. Sure, sure. Big groups certainly, through time. I certainly see that. You see what's happening right now as religions are getting into trouble more and more. They're also losing the good part of religion also at the same time. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the case. There's a book by Robert McCall. It's not very really often quoted, but says, but why religion is natural and science is not. Mm, so people mm. like you and me say, science, that's the answer, right? You've got the facts. But imagine if you went out to a hunter-gatherer who has no ed- ed- education and say, you're made of atoms and you came from a big bang 13 billion years ago. <laughs> so I say, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and then you see a lightning strike there and you say, what's that? So oh, that's God. He killed my brother, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so the idea Macaulay puts forward is that religion is more natural to humans to come up with idea explanation of what the natural, as you get more of reality is salience, you have to deal with it. And religion is a natural way to do that. Mm-hmm. And science is, of course, the more modern way to do it. It started in the Far East and it worked its way to Europe and eventually with what we now call the Age of Enlightenment. It's a very short time. It may not be mm-hmm. last very long. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and it, it does also just kind of remind me of that, again, I mean, to try to be respectful for, for, for people's mm-hmm. beliefs. So here, but is this idea that narratives still to this day are such powerful ways of connecting people. That's why we read books and we see right. films and we watch TV shows and all these, it's a narrative that pulls things together, not right. Kind of the, the hard scientific facts and okay, that's going to tell me you need it woven together in a narrative. And religion right. is very powerful at doing that. It's very powerful yeah, very at telling good. good narratives to help us together, you know? Um, but yes, there are, we can be- we can believe our beliefs uh, too hard sometimes, and uh, gets right. us into trouble. <laughs> so I think there's there's a there's a, a, a danger there. 
I guess uh, a little bit here, I saw, you've mentioned a little bit, and this is probably where that extended theory of mind comes in, the role of cultural and, and technological advances throughout time have helped us to deny this reality at kind of a fast pace. How essential is that as we see cultural and technological and a digital revolutions throughout time? How do these things also uh, help us, you know, kind of hold off the bad parts of reality we don't like? Yeah, well, positive, I mean, Denying reality is really very powerful in many ways. I mean, what is optimism? Denial of reality. Mm-hmm. It was extreme optimism, extreme denial of reality, right? Mm. My grandfather was a friend of Gandhi, and I grew up thinking, what is this man thinking is going to take on the British Empire with nonviolence? <laughs> you know, what the hell is that? Mm. And when he succeeds, but he pays the price, but then you get Nelson Mandela, and then you get Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's theory of mind being spread from there, right? So, mm. so op- what Charlie Short calls the optimism bias, humans are in. Intrinsically optimistic, basically. Mm. If you want optimistic, you wouldn't get out of bed every day. And the few, few, few humans who are not optimistic at all, usually those who are depressed, basically, because they, they appreciate reality. <laughs> so it's about depressive realism. Yeah, 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 but isn't there this idea that I think it's, called, it's from social psych um, that we we tend to have a, a kind of a, a trait negativity bias, right? That we we usually are going to see. Okay, what's what's the worst that's going to happen, right? Let me make sure I don't get harmed. Let me make sure I don't get killed. But do we also have this? It sounds like we have a mixture of both. That we can yes, not stay exactly. there, but that we do have this. We do have a propensity as well to also say, how can I look at the positive aspects of things as well? And then you can transmit that right. through other other big thinkers and and, and movements. Right. Yeah. So here's the problem. So the same brain to hold optimism and pessimism and reality at the same time is very hard. So you've got to be in one place or the other. Mm. So it's very difficult because you have to be in the middle, either you're in one extreme or the other. Mm-hmm. So look at climate change and climate disaster going on right now. Yeah. Many of us understand and appreciate it, but we somehow think somehow it's going to work out. You know, somehow it's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out. Humans will figure it out. You know. We don't do everything we should be doing. On the other hand, if you didn't have the optimism, you just curl up and give up. You know, Nothing would ever happen. So. So you have these two powerful ends of the spectrum of optimism and total, total reality understanding and everything in between in human, the human population. And I mm. think that gives power to do many things that any other animals couldn't, so basically. Mm. I guess the, the thing was, so you mentioned climate change in the book, and obviously it's, it's mm-hmm. unfortunately always an evergreen kind of topic for, for, <laughs> for all the wrong reasons. But um, yeah, I find this... I find this is also difficult too, right? Because like we, there's a it's a kind of species type of extension kind of thing, extinction thing, mm-hmm. and it's tough. It's bleak, obviously, right? But I guess it's also one of those things where, when we have positive moments, where think about things like yes, we can acknowledge uh, human involvement for for the mm-hmm. changing of the planet, and obviously, it's climate change is real, and it's and humans are a big factor in that. So they call it climate corruption. Yeah, yeah, yes. But we do have some positive moments too, where people, you know, have we're trying our best to, you know, solar panels, electric cars, reforestation, trying to fix some aspects of the the coral reef. We do have positive moments. I feel like it's sometimes it's such a hard thing when you hear something that's factually based that is real, and then it says, well we don't want to look at the positive things because then it might make us forget that there's really a big problem still out there. How do we do both of these things at the same time? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to have the same brains do the same thing. So, a friend of mine, <laughs> yes. uh, B- 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 at, at Scripps here, he's the one who convinced, the, one of the people who convinced the Pope to put out his encyclical on ch- climate change. Convinced him. So, I've stuck to Ram over the years, what do you do about this? I said, you know, you have to, he said you have to be optimistic. You have to, Tell people that it's going to be okay. You've got to work hard at it. Mm-hmm. They don't. It doesn't work then. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, the other, the other extreme is fear, right? Mm-hmm. Fear is very powerful, but it can be a bad, bad motivator in other ways. Sure, yeah. So if you think, think of all the things, except one exception I can think of is, a, is the threat of nuclear destruction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mass, mass destruction. That's the only thing where maybe the ozone layer where we humans said, you know, this is really bad. We should not have this happen. <laughs> right. We actually got together and did something about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes succeeded. Mm-hmm. But in most cases, we just ignore the reality as much as we can. Mm. We do it ourselves, you know. So mm-hmm. my daughter called me up from and said, I'm coming to Miami. Should I drop over to San Diego? I said, sure, please do so immediately. And 
it's just burned a bunch of fossil fuel, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it's so interesting because, you know, we, we live in the age of Oppenheimer, right? And mm-hmm. it's, it's one of these things where, you know, there, there's this notion of, it's, it's awful that we, we see this. We, we all say we don't want the next Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But mm-hmm. would we say that? If that didn't happen, now I in no means sure. think it should have happened. Absolutely, I wish it didn't. Right, but it's terrible that we have to have exactly. or or that we are that way. Or it's like, oh wow, that is really bad. But why do we need uh, human tragedy at such a mass scale to say maybe we don't do that anymore? That's terrible. Yeah, it's because I think you know the fear factor comes in there, mm-hmm. and you begin to realize. You know, when I was growing up in India, I remember hearing about children in the Cold War, in the U.S. Duck and cover, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's this scale, scale children every day about nuclear war because of the possibility. Mm-hmm. That generation grew, grew up saying, we can't let this happen, you know. Mm-hmm. As you said, it's already been an example. Mm-hmm. But the climate change is a bit difficult because it's harder for people to appreciate what's going on. I think it's, you find that fight, right, right medium between fear and, and realism and optimism and act, active approach. So I come up with a kind of way, way to summarize. Is there a way to be? Is there a way to be? Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can the same brain do that? Mm-hmm. I mean, often not the case. I think, I think in some ways we can, but uh, it's, yeah. it's hard, hard to know. Yeah, right. It's, it's it's not always really enough. So there are positive aspects of denying reality. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, day to day, but even when people have chronic illness or terminal illness or, mm-hmm. or things like sure. that, it can, you can't just sit with that. You have to say, okay, mm-hmm. you know, but that seems so counterintuitive in some ways, right? Logically from our logical brains to say, well, I'm going to actively deny reality. And, and I wonder how much of our, our lives, when you realize things, when you think about free will, let's say, you know, this kind of, for me, mm-hmm. this illusionary aspect mm-hmm. of free will, and that we have this idea of denying reality and self-deception. I mean, when people ask what's true and what's real, we don't ever really operate that way some, most times. No, it's, it's, so, it's such a paradox, no? I and mean, what do you think about these well, positive look, aspects look, look, and this component? Yeah, look, look at preventive medicine. They're tearing the hair out. They told us exactly how, to, how we can live long and be healthier, right? Uh-huh. Everybody says, yes. Uh-huh. I'm a physician. I don't do most of the things I'm supposed to do. I do mm-hmm. my exercise this morning mm-hmm. and do the things I'm supposed to do for my health. Mm-hmm. I said, it won't happen to me, you know, mm-hmm. to somebody mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. And so there's this ability, to, even, for, even for people who have the full knowledge, to still carry the denial in their heads. Without mm-hmm. that, they can't live, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, but can, so both theory and denial can be used for extreme, ex, both very positive, very negative reasons. So, yeah, that's such a strange way to say it that way. I mean, I totally agree with you. But in order to live, we have to have a, a way of deceiving ourselves of the realities that are there, and that's such a wild paradox, right? Like it's mm-hmm. when you say it out loud, yeah, like, like, it's crazy. Well, the thing is, you have to think about it in evolution terms. People always mm-hmm. say, "I'm not so scared about it; it'll be okay." You know? So you, you should think back to the first person, first individuals in Africa who came up with this concept of theory of, uh, came up with the theory of mind and fear of death, mm-hmm. and and then they they're in really serious trouble till they can start denying reality or mm-hmm. some circular argument there. Mm-hmm. That's very hard, hard to bring together, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> I guess the one of the, the the last questions I have for you is, um, you know, where do you think as we progress as a human species, you know, we have all of this integration with, you know, different forms of technology and connected digitally and all these things. How do we, this, you know, theory here, this is, you know, mind over reality kind of thing. How do we, how do we see this progressing, I guess, in the future? What do you think is the ways in which we continue to wrestle with these things and, and maybe from a bigger view, kind of the long, long view in terms of evolution or things like that, how do we see, what do you think would be iterations of this when you look to the future? Unfortunately, I think we're in real trouble because most of us, including myself, are in some level of denial about something or the other that we should be paying attention to, mm. the natural state of humans. And now as we move into virtual reality and other states, altered states, and even now children spend half their awake time sometimes just being in a different world. 
you know, we, we, our brains have evolved 200,000 years ago, not evolved to, to handle that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think we're going to get more and more trouble as people alter reality and mm-hmm. constantly in all directions. So mm. I'm a yeah. bit, bit pessimistic with the whole thing, I'm afraid. But mm. yeah, well, it's, it's certainly, there's certainly major concerns. I uh, I guess the, the the one thing here is uh you know is it's such a fascinating uh idea it's such a fascinating the book's great I guess what are what are you know a few things or any any big big things that you want to share with with listeners about your ideas on this or any way you want people to think about this what are some of your kind of final thoughts here on any of this So just just to explain why the book came out so long ago and did not much talk about it I, I, this, I met Danny Brown at the time and I was very busy with other things and wrote the book. And here's a book by an insect genetist, dead insect genetist, Danny, a physician scientist who claimed to have understood the human mind, right? So we had the right people to come up with an idea like this. <laughs> so it hasn't really taken root. And I haven't, honestly, I haven't taken the trouble to, to pursue it further and, and really push it out. Mm-hmm. As, as I should have, I have many other things that I do and succeed in better. And there's some websites like Rob Milkarski, I think his name, mm-hmm. undenial.com. There's several people who I get the emails every month or so saying, Oh, I read your book. Finally I understand what's wrong with people, you know. So <laughs> So think about think about this book is to say that the theory is to say this theory is not proven. Right. It's consistent with all known facts. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, Thomas Huxley, the famous comp- comp- a companion of a compatriot of uh, Charles Darwin said, A beautiful theory is slain by an ugly fact. Mm-hmm. So I've been searching for the last 20 years for an ugly fact that slaves this theory. Mm-hmm. Nothing, not, not, if you can find one, any listener can find one, let me know. Something, mm-hmm. not, not something that I don't like, it. that doesn't help me. <laughs> because of this, because of this fact, it cannot be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It fits everything, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, to look around. So, it, well, you so know, consistent with everything. <clears throat> I, I listen, I mean, you need good theory, right? You need good theory to build off of things and you yeah. test it, you prove it, but you can't do the reverse, right? Just testing and proving something without theory is, I don't think always the best. I think good theory can go far and you're right. It's rooted in all of the things, genetics, evolutionary biology, things like that. And so- Especially things that happen very rarely, you know? So mm-hmm, humans mm-hmm. emerged only once. Yeah. So actually, yeah. I've come back to think about this more. That's, if, you, if, you, if you come to the emergency room in coma and you don't have any relatives with you, Mm-hmm. There's a few things in your pocket. The worst thing you can do is call your neurologist immediately. Mm-hmm. And you want a general physician who looks over the whole body and looks at what's going on and then figures out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Then you call the neurologist in. You may have to be careful to assume that logic, there's no, as you know, as you know there's no, there's no uh, intelligent designer. Mm-hmm. So this happened only once. Yeah. It's like that single patient in a coma. Mm-hmm. And it could happen anyway. So it could yeah. have been the most bizarre way you think of. So logic won't give you the answer. But what we see now is the end product. We just can't go back and recreate it exactly. So mm. it's hard to mm. think of experiments. You can think of experiments that will support the theory, but mm. actually re- reproduce will be very hard. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what we say is all, all the other species, all these other species in Europe and Asia, all disappeared. So uh-huh. we had something uh-huh. going for us. So. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Ajit, this was uh, so much fun. I, I read your book years ago. I, I was so happy that uh, when I reached out, you agreed to do it. I really appreciate you uh, being so kind with your time and energy, uh, d- despite uh, some of the, the challenges you that I had mentioned in the beginning. I, I really appreciate your, your willingness and your, your endurance here and your, your um, you know, just brilliance and how you're looking at these things. So it's a Really, it's a big honor that you took your time to to talk about it, and well, I'm pleasure, very grateful yeah. for that. Yeah.